Good morning and welcome to Tuesdays with the Pilgrim. Today we continue reading C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, with Chapter 9. My dear Wormwood, I hope my last letter has convinced you that the trough of dullness or dryness through which your patient is going at present will not of itself give you his soul, but needs to be properly exploited. What forms the exploitation should take, I will now consider. In the first place, I have always found that the trough periods of the human undulation provide excellent opportunity for all sensual temptations, particularly those of sex. This may surprise you because, of course, there is more physical energy and therefore more potential appetite at the peak periods. But you must remember that the powers of resistance are then also at their highest. The health and spirits which you want to use in producing lust can also, alas, be very easily used for work or play, or thought or innocuous merriment. The attack has a much better chance of success when the man's whole inner world is drab and cold and empty. And it is also to be noted that the trough sexuality is subtly different in quality from that of the peak much less likely to lead to the milk-and-water phenomenon which humans call, quote, being in love, unquote, and much more easily drawn into perversions, much less contaminated by those generous and imaginative and even spiritual contaminants which often render human sexuality so disappointing. It is the same with other desires of the flesh. You are much more likely to make your man a sound drunkard by pressing drink on him as an anodyne when he is dull and weary than by encouraging to use it as a means of merriment among his friends when he is happy and expansive. Never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure, all the same, it is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy has produced, at times or in ways or in degrees which he has forbidden. Hence, we always try to work away from the natural condition of any pleasure to that in which it is least natural, least redolent of its maker, and least pleasurable, an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure is the formula. It is more certain, and it is better style, to get a man's soul and to give him nothing in return. That is what really gladdens our father's heart, and the troughs are the time for beginning the process. But there is an even better way of exploiting the trough. I mean through the patient's own thoughts about it. As always, the first step is to keep knowledge out of his mind. Do not let him suspect the law of undulation. Let him assume that the first ardors of his conversion might have been expected to last, and ought to have lasted forever, and that his present dryness is an equally permanent condition. Having once got his misconception well fixed in his head, you may then proceed in various ways. It all depends on whether your man is of the desponding type who can be tempted to despair, or of the wishful thinking type who can be assured that all is well. The former type is getting rare among humans. If your patient should happen to belong to it, everything is easy. You have only to keep him out of the way of experienced Christians, an easy task nowadays, and direct his attention to the appropriate passages in Scripture and then to set him to work on the desperate design of recovering his old feelings by sheer willpower, and the game is ours. If he is of the more hopeful type, your job is to make him acquiesce in the presence of low temperature of his spirit, and gradually become content with it, persuading himself that it is not so low after all. In a week or two you will be making him doubt whether the first days of his Christianity were not, perhaps, a little excessive. Talk to him about moderation in all things. If you can once get him to the point of thinking that religion is all very well up to a point, you can feel quite happy about his soul. A moderated religion is as good for us as no religion at all, 
and more amusing. Another possibility is that direct attack on his faith. When you have caused him to assume that the trough is permanent, can you not persuade him that, quote, his religious phase, unquote, is just going to die away like all his previous phases? Of course, there is no conceivable way of getting by reason from the proposition, quote, I am losing interest in this, unquote, to the proposition, quote, this is false, unquote. But as I said before, it is jargon, not reason, you must rely on. The mere word phrase will very likely do the trick. I assume that the creature has been through several of them before, they all have, and that he always feels superior and patronizing to the ones he has emerged from, not because he has really criticized them, but simply because they are in the past. You keep him well fed on hazy ideas of progress and development, and the historical point of view, I trust, and give him lots of modern biographies to read. The people in them are always emerging from phases, aren't they? You see the idea? Keep his mind off the plain antithesis between true and false. Nice shadowy expressions. Quote, it was a phase, unquote. I've been through that before. And don't forget the blessed word, adolescent. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. <laughs> That's the end of chapter 9. Next week we'll continue with chapter 10. Until then, take care, stay safe, and God bless. Yeah.